Well, in around an hour's time, U.S. President Joe Biden will announce a new plan to deal with extreme heat. Mr. Biden is expected to reveal new funding for communities and steps to boost the offshore wind industry. The White House says climate change is an existential threat to the world. And if Congress fails to act, uh, the president will take executive action. With more on this, I'm joined by Arise U.S. correspondent Eric Ham, who is in Washington. Great to see you, uh, Eric. So uh, President Biden delivering a major climate address today. Uh, tell us more about what he's likely to say and whether that's going to fall short of expectations. Well, let's start with the fact that, yes, this is going to fall very, very short of expectations, Charles. And just for our viewers to understand, uh, Congress and the White House have actually been working on massive climate change legislation for more than a year now. In fact, this is something that there had been buy-in from Democrats, Republicans. And it was just last week that we learned that Senator Joe Manchin, who, uh, who Democrats and the White House have been working to try to bring along to actually get legislation through, actually pulled out of negotiations at the 11th hour. And this comes after the senator from West Virginia, a Democrat, mind you, had announced in March that something needed to be done and that he wanted to actually move this issue forward. And so this was a break that the, the White House certainly welcomed at the time. Remember, when President Biden came into office, Climate change was a major priority for this administration. He moved the United States back into the Paris Climate Accords and began working not only with national leaders, but with international leaders to try to address the, the growing concern over climate change. And so now uh, the president and many Democrats are equally upset about what took place and, uh, Joe, and Senator Joe Manchin's 11th hour decision to pull out of these negotiations. Now what we're seeing is President Biden has said today that he will announce executive orders, but these executive orders simply do not go as far as the legislation that was currently under uh, negotiations. That legislation was going to uh, limit carbon emissions, uh, appropriate billions of dollars uh, for resources. It was going to uh, 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 eliminate uh, taxes and create uh, tax havens for those that actually uh, fuel and, and promote uh, climate change initiatives. And so what we're seeing today is the president announcing these executive orders, which is simply just the president saying that this is what the government will support. Uh, but, it, but again, it doesn't go nearly as far and is not nearly as comprehensive as what the administration was hoping that they would actually be able to pass, particularly in light of the massive heat wave, heat wave and continued uh, climate fluctuations that we're seeing take place across the country with power outages in the state of Texas. And of course, wildfires continuing to rage throughout the, the, the West Coast and the Northwest as well. So basically, Eric, it sounds like it's going to take the Democrats is expanding their majorities in, in the uh, midterm elections to defeat the Republicans who have voted against climate change. And, and I also understand that more than that, the Republicans now control the Supreme Court. And I understand the court has been overturning Obama era regulations on CO2. That's absolutely right. What we have seen is uh, the Supreme Court has basically taken a knife to many of those uh, measures that were implemented during the Obama administration, uh, where we actually saw massive improvements, particularly around the issue of climate change. Remember, it was the Obama administration that actually provided uh, significant funding uh, to Tesla Corporation run by Elon Musk. Uh, which is now seen as a major arbiter in creating electric vehicles, not only across the country, but across the globe as well. And so now what we're seeing is uh, as the United States continues to uh, try to address this issue nationally, what we're seeing are a number of states continuing to individually uh, try to address these issues. But again, because it's oftentimes it's left to states to actually do the tackle these issues individually, you don't have an across the board uh, plan or strategy and that's in place. And so that's what the United States is missing right now. That's what Democrats were hoping they would be able to accomplish. But 
we do know that Senator Joe Manchin, even though he pulled out of this agreement, says that he believes something needs to be done. So maybe it's possible he will come back to the negotiating table. But again, what we continue to hear and see from Senator Joe Manchin is something that is quite inexplicable and hard to actually figure out. But the president today will announce uh, these new executive action orders. Will it placate many of the restless Democrats on the left? We don't know. But again, many are looking again towards what can happen in the midterm elections where they believe they, they can pick up seats in the Senate to be able to actually get something done. Well, we'll be listening out for what the president has to say later today. But Eric, stay with me because I do want to come back to you in just a moment. Uh, Ukraine's first lady has told the U.S. Congress that Russia is conducting an unprovoked invasive terrorist war against her country. Elena Zelenska says Moscow is destroying her people. She showed photographs of children whose lives have been ripped apart by the war and asked for more air defense systems to stop kids being killed. Her plea for weapons was met by a standing ovation from congressional leaders. I am asking for something now I would never want to ask. I am asking for weapons. Weapons that would not be used to wage a war on somebody else's land, but to protect one's home and the right to wake up alive in that home. I am asking for air defense systems in order for rockets not to kill children in their strollers. This is what I'm asking for and what my husband is asking for, not as a presidential couple but as parents and children of their parents because we want every father and every mother to be able to tell their child, go to sleep peacefully. There will be no more air strikes, no more missile strikes. Is this too much to wish for? And that's a Ukraine's first lady there. Well, still with me is a rise U.S. correspondent, Eric Ham. Uh, Eric, you listened in to that speech. She got a standing ovation, but is she going to get what she's asking for? Well, Charles, uh, I didn't actually just listen. I was actually there uh, for the speech that she gave uh, this morning. Uh, she spoke to a joint session of Congress where there were both members from uh, both chambers, from the House of Representatives as well as from the Senate. And she was warmly received. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, introduced her and addressed the audience first. And what we heard from the Ukrainian First Lady was a very stark, very dire picture of what is taking place on the ground in Ukraine. And she spoke to uh, these members of Congress, not as the first lady of Ukraine, but she spoke to them as she said, uh, I'm quoting as a mother and as a daughter, and that uh, what she wants to see is protection for mothers and for, for daughters and for children throughout Ukraine. She thanked uh, Congress for their con continued contributions. But she also made clear that that the Ukraine needs more and that uh, she needs to, she would like to see the United States provide the military capabilities not to go on the offensive, but to protect Ukraine from an ongoing offensive from Russia. Uh, as you mentioned, she received several standing ovations and she was certainly welcomed uh, by members. And it's important to note that she received a warm uh, warm ovations both from Republicans and Democrats, from uh, members of the House and Senate. And of course, we know just a few months ago, Congress had already appropriated more than $40 billion uh, for both humanitarian and security assistance to Ukraine. In fact, already the United States is the biggest supporter of Ukraine since this war actually began. Well, that's precisely the, the issue, isn't it, Eric? Uh, I'm wondering whether beyond the sort of the optics of uh, her addressing Congress, whether war fatigue is beginning to set in. Uh, well, not from the looks of it here in uh, the United States, Charles. In fact, if you travel across the country, and I've had the opportunity to do that, uh, over this summer, you see enormous support for Ukraine. You go to different places, both in uh, the rural South as well as the Midwest, and you see flags, uh, Ukrainian flags flying everywhere. You see support uh, in shops, in stores, in businesses where it says we support Ukraine, uh, we support the Ukrainians. And so what we're seeing here is uh, right now, while there is a growing concern that there could be fatigue for Ukraine, Right now, we simply have not seen that. In fact, just yesterday, we know that there was a vote 
in Congress, where an overwhelming majority of members of Congress supported both NATO and Sweden's uh, membership to uh, NATO. Of course, there were some Republicans that voted against it. But, but again, what we see uh, throughout Congress is an overwhelming amount of support. And while there is no more uh, resources that will be forthcoming because uh, the administration has yet to draw down that full $40 billion to Ukraine, uh, that money is expected to actually go through November, so through the midterm elections, and many expect that Congress, as well as this Biden administration, will continue to provide both economic, humanitarian, and security assistance to Ukraine throughout this war with Russia. Eric, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Eric Ham, Arise U.S. correspondent, talking to me from Washington. There.